Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another impromptu, completely unscheduled edition of the Critical Blast podcast, live stream, vlog, blog, whatever we want to call this thing. I am usually R.J. Carter, Senior Managing Editor at CriticalBlast.com, where pop culture gets blasted. But tonight, I'm somebody different. And that's because tonight, the Flash is back on, and we are still gearing up toward the Crisis on Infinite Earths coming this December and then finishing in January, uh, which is a very, very cruel thing to do. Dark Admiral March Hare, pleased to see you. And, and I think, you know, we all have our comfortable ways of watching a show. Um, we get under our nice, perfect little snuggie, or we like to have our little pillow that we like and curl up on the couch. Um, but I got to tell you, there's only one way to watch The Flash. And that's to be prepared to run. So let's run with it. Crisis on Infinite Earths. Take it from somebody who was there. I knew Crisis on Infinite Earths. Crisis on Infinite Earths was a friend of mine. Crisis on Infinite Earths was, actually it was going to be called Universe. That was what the uh, promos called it in the uh, in-house advertisements. It was just this big Universe logo. And then Crisis on Infinite Earths was a subtitle. Uh, Matt, hey, how's it going? Glad to have you here. And then slowly it became crisis, and then it became crisis on infinite earths, and it was uh, it was a big deal. And it was driven by editorial policy. Uh, probably one of the few times that that actually worked. Probably because they had all of the editorial on board with the process. It wasn't uh, piecemeal like now. Uh, if we still had Dick Giordano, Paul Levitz, Mark Wolfman. Uh, Carrie Bates, all those people still around at DC right now, Doomsday Clock would be having a much more profound impact on every other title. The Superman theory would be permeating every DC book right now, and there'd be suspicion on every character. That's not happening. Event Leviathan isn't even happening in every book because every book is now insular. You know, it's, it's Batman and Catwoman are taking on Bane and going through his personal mental crisis, except when they're in Justice League or Superman or Superman Batman, and there's no cohesiveness to it. That's a, sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. I think for DC right now, it's a bad thing. But the DC editorial of 1980s had a thought to bring in new readers, and their first surmisement was that new readers are stupid, that they could not understand the concept of DC that was unique to that comic company. And that was the theory of multiple Earths, the whole einstein rosen Podolsky bridge, that multiple Earths existed in the same space, but at different vibratory rates. And that every decision, every major decision, both of them happened in a very um, Schrodingerian way. So that whenever something major happened, one Earth became two Earths. On this Earth, you chose this, and on this Earth, you chose that. Uh, there's a very, very good short story by Larry Niven called All the Myriad Ways. Uh, in fact, if you can find that book of the same title, uh, it's a collection of essays. Uh, All the Myriad Ways is entirely about traversing the multiverse and the difficulty it is in getting back to the same multiverse you left from and how you can't get quite there, but you get almost there to where it's indeterminable and the, all the infinite use come back to all the infinite places of the same place. But there was this broadening of the band so that the similarity point was getting wider and wider. And sometimes two of you showed up in the same place and one of them died. Uh, it was very interesting as people thought about how they made a choice and it affected their life so that, you know, one person was miserable, but because you're miserable, one other version of you is going to be happy. It was very kind of dismal, but that was what was permeating science fiction at the time. And that's what got into DC editorial writers' heads. So that when they introduced uh, the Flash, the 19, the Silver Age Flash in Showcase 4, 
Barry Allen, he was able to, uh, he, he knew of J. Garrick the Flash, not from history books, he knew of him from comic books. And when he realized that he could run very fast, he's like, hey, I'm just like my comic book hero from my kid, from my childhood, from my kidhood. I write for a living, would you believe that? He said, I'm gonna call myself the Flash. And he came up with a whole new costume. The same thing was true of Green Lantern, although Green Lantern didn't know about the Alan Scott stuff. Uh, it wasn't until, uh, you know, oh, let's see. I, I know he met him before Green Lantern 40, but Green Lantern 40 was a pivotal issue where the two of them crossed over. And it was kind of funny. They exchanged rings so that the bad guy was throwing all the wrong weaknesses at them. He threw yellow at Hal Jordan. Hal Jordan's wearing the ring that's ineffective against wood. Uh, yeah, if you really wanted to confuse the Green Lantern of Earth too, just run through the woods. Uh, you can't, you're, you're pretty safe uh, because his ring was useless against wood. That's a hell of a weakness to throw something, take him out with a baseball bat. Um, anyway, Earth 1 and Earth 2 were fine and dandy, but when the Justice League and the Justice Society met, all of a sudden there was a crisis on Earth 3. And Earth 3 was where you had all the evil versions of the Justice League. That was where the crime syndicate lived. That was your Ultraman. That was your Superwoman, your Owlman, your Power Ring, your Johnny Quick. Uh, and it was, it was interesting to see that. Now, there was another Earth, Earth C, where uh, all the criminals, all, all the Justice League characters were criminals. That one didn't take off as well, but they were, they were more thug-like criminals than these masterminded uh, crime syndicate people. There was Earth X, where the Freedom Fighters were. We saw Crisis on Earth X in the CW crossover series, and they did almost nothing with the Freedom Fighters concept after that. Uh, you thought maybe we'd have got a spinoff or something. I don't know. Maybe it was just too out there for them to continue with. Uh, we had Earth S, which was where the Shazam family lived. Uh, so there was, when there was a crisis in Earth S, that happened there. One of the real pivotal things for me when they did this, they explored something called Earth Prime. Now, Earth Prime is what made the DC universe a real living entity for all its fans, because Earth Prime was here. And if the Justice League or anyone ever came here, they found out that their entire lives were open books, literally, because they were comic book characters. Uh, and I think it was uh, Julie Schwartz had to help the Flash get back to Earth too, so it was it was very um, it was it was one of like it was like an assistant editor's month kind of thing, but it got me to thinking about the upcoming crisis, on Infinite Earths, novelization by Mark Wolfman, excellent read, more in depth, really do pick it up, um, and all the different Earths we're going to see in the CW series, and I thought, wouldn't it be funny if one of the Earths was Earth Prime, where we don't have a Flash, but we do have a television show where the Flash is played by Grant Gustin, and Grant Gustin could play himself, and Melissa Benoist could play herself. And just to have that brief interaction with the superpowered versions of who you're playing, I don't know, that's just how my mind works. Of course, they've already filmed it. I hope somebody had that idea. That would be kind of fun. Uh, but again, there were so many Earths, as you know, they were saying, there were infinite number of them. And the multiverse was just this concept that editorial said, you know, if we, we can't explain this to normies and we want to get more readers in. Uh, so let's make it simpler. Let's bring the line down somewhere. So they did. They, they had this huge storyline where they crunched everything together. They said, okay, we're going to make the Justice Society have existed. But in World War II, which where they existed anyway, the Earth II was always kind of like time shifted back. Um, and they were a lot older there. But uh, they existed in World War II. And then uh, somewhere along the way, the, the new generation came along. Uh, Infinity Inc. was the offspring of the Justice Society. They were sort of the modern version of them. Uh, we were going to have every commandy existed in the future at some point, And the Legion of the Future, uh, Legion of Superheroes existed at some point in the future. Jonah Hex went somewhere into the future and in the past. Uh, and it was all going to be one cohesive timeline. And they put out this beautiful two volume book called The History of the DC Universe so that you could finish Crisis and then pick this up and read Harbinger's notes 
that told you exactly, here's the DC Bible. This is what happened in the beginning, Dr. Manhattan. I mean, a big blue hand created the uh, universe and you know, held galaxies in its, in its palm. And then things went off. Uh, we started with Anthro, the first boy, and just moved on from there all the way through the Camelot era. And <laughs> all right, see you, Matt. Thanks for coming by. Uh, but yeah, we saw the entirety of the DC universe play out from beginning to end in these two volumes. So it was very, very cool. Um, I missed the multiverse almost immediately. And I thought it was something that could be, um, I didn't think people were stupid for one thing. I thought they could catch on to it. And apparently uh, that's no longer the thought process there anyway, because they do have a multiverse of stories going on. In fact, we now have a dark multiverse. We have CW uh, talking about the multiverse. And let's face it, if you're gonna talk about a normie audience, you don't get more normie than people who are going to sit down and watch CW shows. That's just the way it is. But one of the things they did right coming out of crisis was they rebooted Superman. And they did this with John Byrne's Man of Steel. Uh, this was a great thing that they, if they wanted to do rebirth right, this is exactly what they should have done. They should have restarted everything, but they wanted to restart some things and they wanted to hold on to others. And that's where things got messed up. So. Well, technically, they kind of rebooted Superman with the New 52, uh, and they kind of rebooted the Justice League. Uh, everything that happened in Batman still happened. That was still, you know, part of the history. And we didn't get that baseline for everything to be on. I, I think that was a huge, huge mistake for DC at that point. Um, not that, you know, coming out of crisis wasn't without its problems. Uh, we had to reboot Wonder Woman because she died in it. Uh, she was reverted back to the primordial magical clay that uh, had she had been sculpted from in the first place. Uh, she wasn't the daughter of Zeus. She was, um, Hippolyta was lonely for a child and she formed one out of clay and it was given life. That was the original secret origin of Wonder Woman. Uh, we had leftover people who were from Earth 2, but were not part of the timeline history. They were like these remnants. You had the original Huntress, which was the daughter of Bruce Wayne. Uh, you had the Earth 2 Dick Grayson. They had no idea where they were going to go. And then they were just kind of gone. Uh, basically, there were only a handful of people who truly remembered that a crisis happened. And then they forgot about it kind of as well, uh, because it was just easier not to know that there were multiple Earths before. Uh, the only person who did remember it was the psycho pirate because he was truly outside it all working for the anti-monitor. Uh, and we have seen the psycho pirate in the crossover on Earth X. So let's, uh, wait, so what's the crisis? No, no, it wasn't that one. It was uh, the Elseworlds crisis. I'm getting my crises mixed up here. Uh, I need some crisis management. Anyhow, uh, they, they rebooted Superman, but they didn't reboot, they, they rebooted everybody. That, that was the beauty of it, and they didn't do that with Rebirth. They should have. It would have been a much better concept, I think. Uh, for my money, if I were to buy DC from AT&T right now, I would, I would do that. I would flatline everything. We'd go back to Batman for five years with no Robin. First Robin would come along, beat Dick Grayson, and he'd beat Dick Grayson forever in a day. Um, perpetual teenager. There wouldn't be this moving timeline. Uh, Teen Titans would still be teenagers. It wouldn't be this uh, angsty group of 30 somethings. So <laughs> uh, I'm gonna take the hat off. Um, secret origin of the hat. I found this on eBay. This is a World War I doughboy hat. Uh, and my wife had a broken angel that I was able to sand the wings down at the angle I wanted and paint them the way I wanted. Polish the hat up, had a lot of rust on it. Uh, probably blood, probably some poor man died in this thing. And here I am turning it into a cosplay prop. Uh, I lined the inside of it with uh, door caulking to give it something to sit on because the original liner was rotted out. And without the original liner, there's a, there's a bolt in the top of it that just kind of <laughs> drills right into your head. Um, very uncomfortable. So today we got to see some of the Superman shots that are coming out of Crisis on Infinite Earths. We've seen Tyler Hecklin. Uh, we've seen... Brandon Routh, 
and we've seen uh, Tom Welling not in a Superman costume, and I don't know if we'll ever see Tom Welling in a Superman costume. Uh, and it's interesting because Brandon Routh is supposed to be the Superman from Kingdom Come, and yet the shots we see of Tom Welling look far more like the Superman we see at the beginning of Kingdom Come when he's standing in the field that's actually a uh, hologram of of Smallville in his Fortress of Solitude. Let's see if I can find that real quick here. Oh, uh, maybe I can, maybe I can't. I know I just saw it over there a second ago because I was looking for some other stuff. Uh, but regardless, uh, I am looking forward to it. One of the things I said, you know, I said the crisis was a good thing and that there were some bad things that came out of it. But one of it was the remnants where we didn't quite get plot threads wrapped up. The second one was Hawkman. Uh, Hawkman was one of those characters where he was in the Justice Society and he was in the Justice League and none of his origins could make sense. Um, see, when they, when they did put the Justice Society in the past and the Justice League in the present and made them all on the same one timeline, well, your, your doppelgangers had to go away. So the Golden Age Wonder Woman uh, was, was ascended to Olympus and became a goddess. Uh, your Golden Age Batman did not exist, was never there. Uh, your Golden Age Superman, no, did not happen. And because Golden Age Superman didn't happen, but Power Girl was still there, totally messed up her origin. Um, they ended up doing something where she was the granddaughter of Arion, uh, Lord of Atlantis, well, not Lord of Atlantis, but Arion of Atlantis. He was a master magician. So her powers became manifest as strength, but they were based in magic. And people were like, what? That, that makes absolutely no sense. Why is she so Kryptonian? Um, now, of course, she's from Earth 2 again, I think. No, I'm not quite sure because, again, we rebirthed some things, but we didn't rebirth other things. Um, and we knew 52 a lot, too. I'm not quite sure what the mystique was with 52 for DC either, but um, I'm not going to question it. It was a heck of a series. Countdown was a good series. Oh, interesting thing today. We uh, we were talking about Booster Gold being shot in the head during the countdown uh, by Max Lord and how difficult that was for the artist to draw. Phil Jimenez was on uh, Twitter talking about that. And I had just gone through, when, when I talked earlier about going through all my Justice Leagues in stacks of 12s and counting the words and all of them, I'd run across the uh, Giffen Maguire series. And one of the scenes that I came across when I was counting the pages uh, was Booster Gold and Blue Beetle on the island of Kui 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 uh, with the scam over. Uh, Booster Blue Beetle was going to call home and get, get a ride home. And Booster Gold was like, oh, great. I can't wait to get home so Max Lord can put a bullet in my head. And Booster and Blue Beetle replied, "Oh, come off of it, Booster. Max would never do that." And I thought, "Well, what was some grim foreshadowing of uh, Booster Gold's fate uh, ten years later down the road?" But uh, so I shared that. I thought it was just, just interesting. I don't know if the writer who uh, actually pulled the trigger on Ted was aware of that panel and decided to play with that. Uh, if he did, great research. If not, uh, wonderful serendipity in the comic book world. So anyway, Flash is getting ready to come on in a half hour. I do want to be ready for that, and I'm going to be following that up by watching Arrow, uh, which means it'll be a late night for me. But hopefully you guys will be watching too. If you do like The Flash, I'd like to recommend uh, David Taylor's Twitter account, uh, DT2Chats, where he runs the Flash Chat um, conversation every Tuesday at noon Central Time. And he answers his answers your questions live on his video podcast. Uh, so check that out. Uh, hashtag Flash Chat. It's a very kind of fun time where you, you talk about last week's episode before the new week's episode begins. It's interesting conversations to be had there. Critical Blast. I am RJ Carter, a.k.a. Jay Garrick, signing off. We'll see you again soon.